Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll try and walk you through a little bit of thinking about how do we actually tackle global warming? So fundamentally, and let's just get that straight, yes, global warming is a real, mostly man-made problem, something that will have a significant and negative impact, so it's clearly something we need to tackle. We should also get a sense of proportion, and I totally agree with Chris that we should not be focusing on anecdotes. We should be focusing on what do we actually know, and the UN Climate Panel told us that by 2070, global warming will have the total negative impact of somewhere between 0.2 and 2% of global GDP. That gives you a sense of proportion. This is definitely a huge cost, but it's also a limited cost in the sense it's not the end of the world, it's a problem we need to tackle. And that's why we need to have a smarter conversation about how do we think about global warming. I think there's a lot of exaggeration. Um, Chris mentioned three to five meters. I'm sure he's thinking perhaps you know, 500 or 1,000 years ahead. But you know, normally, we think about the next 100 years, which is about 50 to 100 centimeters. That's certainly an issue. But we should also be aware of the news broadcast that Chris also mentioned. Uh, this is from Tacloban in, in the Philippines in 2013, where we saw terrible destruction. We have this sense that the world is getting worse and worse. But if we actually look at one measure of impacts uh, from extreme weather. We have the best database. It's the, uh, the database from Belgium that almost everyone uses. If we look at how many people die from climate-related disasters over the last 100 years, and I'm going to assume that the next five years are the same as they were from 2010 to 2015. If you just take a look at that, and that is, so that is floods, droughts, storms, wildfires, and extreme temperatures. If you add all of those up, this is the graph that you get. So this is how many people died in the 1920s. About 5 million people died in the world from climate-related disasters. That was, for instance, in 1921, 1 1.2 million people died in Russia because of drought. About 100,000 people died in 1922 because of a hurricane in China. Overall, it adds up to about 5 million people that died. Look at how it's gone since then. The 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and up till today. And again, this is assuming that the first five years are also replicated in the last five years, so from 2016 to 2020. So they are entirely comparable. Sorry, to 2019. Uh, so fundamentally, what we have here is very clearly, contrary to what you believe, it's not actually getting worse. And that's important to recognize. The reason why you think it's getting worse is because of what we call the CNN effect. You see a lot more of these things. So remember, for instance, 70, uh, 75,000, I believe, died in Paris, France, uh, and around Europe in the heat wave in 2003. Those are included up here. We talk a lot about them, but we have to remember that when you add up all of this, and remember, of course, we have almost tripled the number of people on the planet at the same time, we have actually become much better at not dying from extreme weather. At the same time, many of the climate policies that are being proposed are incredibly inefficient. So let's just take, uh, Chris also mentioned the Paris Climate Agreement. It had lots and lots of beautiful words, but let's just take the UN Climate Panel and all the numbers that Chris just uh, uh, presented, pretty much agree that the total impact if everyone does everything they promised in Paris, we will cut about 56 gigatons over the next 15 years, uh, uh, gigaton CO2 equivalent over the next 50, uh, 15 years. That's good. But if we're going to get to 2 degrees, let alone 1.5 degrees, we have to cut almost 6,000 gigatons. So let's just put this in context. Let me just show you this again. So Paris has promised to cut 56 gigatons of CO2 we need to cut about 6,000 gigatons. We have 5,700 gigatons still to go. That means Paris essentially leaves 99% of the problem unsolved. It doesn't mean we can't get somewhere close to that, but it's important to recognize what it is that we are actually promising. And of course, the cost is not trivial. Now, Chris again tells you we should be wary of, uh, of simplistic economics. Of course, we should not just look at economics, just like we should not just look at science. 
We should look at all of these informations, but clearly, just like when you go into a supermarket, it's important that the quality of the product is good. It's also important what you're going to pay for it. So let's just get a sense. If we take the average of all the best individual and collectively period energy uh, economic models, uh, typically from the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum, uh, this is the cost just to do the climate agreement in Paris, if everybody actually does what they promised. So we estimate this will lead to a GDP reduction for the US for about $150 billion, for the EU about $300 billion, China 200. If you add all of this up, it gives you about $1 trillion, so $1,000 billion per year in lost GDP. And remember, this is if everybody does it smartly. If they don't, it'll cost about twice as much. So the fundamental point is we're about to talk about spending one to two trillion dollars per year. This will reduce temperatures somewhere between 0.05 and 0.2 degrees in marginal change. Now, of course, a lot of people hope we're going to do a lot more after Paris, and that will increase the reduction in temperature, but also significantly increase the cost. So this is the right comparison. Is that a good deal? Well, economics would tell you, no, it's not. For every peso, sorry, for every 100 pesos we spend, we probably do about two or three pesos worth of good. That's a terrible investment. And of course, we need to recognize that generally we make useless climate policies. If you look at, for instance, our love with solar PV and, and wind, which almost everyone believes is what's going to solve cl uh, climate change, well, actually, it's trivial energy sources. It's trivial energy sources now, and it's trivial over the next quarter century. Right now, the International Energy Agency estimates we get about 0.5% of global energy from solar and wind. But even in 25 years, even if we do everything we promise in Paris, we will just get 2.4% of our energy from solar and wind. It's not where the solution is going to come from, at least not in the next quarter century. On the other hand, we're going to pay about $3,000 billion. This is, again, the International Energy Agency estimates over the next 25 years. And the net impact of all of this, if we assume that they're all going to replace CO2 at the, uh, at the average rate, which is probably dramatically exaggerated, they will change temperatures by 0 0.018 degrees. So fundamentally, again, spending lots and lots of money doing almost no good. This is not a smart idea. So there are much, much smarter ways. And again, this is where economics can actually help, because economics is partly the science of telling you where can you buy the smartest at the lowest cost, where can you have the biggest impact at the lowest cost. What we found, together with 28 of the world's top climate economists and three Nobel laureates, was that the, by far the best, instead of paying lots of money to cut a little CO2, is to dramatically increase green energy research and development. If we do so, we can innovate the price of green energy down below fossil fuels, and then, of course, everyone will switch. That is a much cheaper, we actually estimate it's about 100 times more effective than current climate policies. That is, for every peso we spend, we'll do about 100 times more good than classic climate policies. And then the last point I want to make, and then I'll stop, is, as Chris warned you about, I'm going to post you what he th says is a false choice. He says we can do it all, but of course, the truth is we can't, we don't. If you watch what's happening right now is that even many developed governments are now starting to use their development money explicitly for climate instead. The UK just announced that they were going to spend about five billion pounds, take it from DFITS, so the, uh, the, uh, the development agency, and give it to the Green Fund. So there are real choices here. What is the world's biggest environmental problem? A lot of people would tend to say it's global warming. If you look at how many people die, it is by nowhere close to the world's biggest problem. By far the biggest problem is indoor air pollution that kills 4.3 million people, outdoor air pollution, lead, water and sanitation, ozone, and then global warming, which kills 141,000 people each year. The World Health Organization estimates that by 2050, more people will die. About 250,000 people a year. So yes, global warming is an increasing problem. It is something we need to tackle, but it's by no means the world's biggest environmental problem. And it's by no means the world's biggest problem. What's the biggest problem? If you again estimate in terms of number of dead, 
by far, poverty is the biggest problem. Poverty probably kills about 18 million people. Remember, there's a bit of overlap in the counting here because it's very hard to separate out the poverty issue and all the others. But fundamentally, this indicate that yes, there is a problem, it is something we need to tackle, but we also need to remember what's the size. And of course also, is this what people worry about? Well, actually, the UN has asked almost 10 million people to tell us what are the biggest priorities for you. This is 10 million people across the entire world. It's the best survey we have. It's not a perfect survey, but it's the best survey that we have. And this is what they told us. The top priorities is education, health, jobs, no corruption, and nutrition. And at the very, very bottom comes global warming. This, again, does not mean we're an advanced civilization. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can do several things. We should definitely do what's smart on climate change. But let me just summarize, and this is my last slide. Yes, global warming is real. Our current policies are pretty much all pain, no gain. There are much smarter ways that we could spend less money and do much more good. And then we really do need to remember that there are many more important problems that we should also fix. Of course, we would like to be in a world where we do everything. But as long as we don't do everything, we really have to ask ourselves, where can we focus the extra peso, the extra dollar, the extra euro, and do the most good? The world wants us to focus on a lot of other things. And there are a lot of other places where we can do a lot of more good first. Thank you very much.